This video explains the basics of numerical optimization within the context of maximum likelihood estimation. What is numerical optimization and why should an applied researcher care? First, very few estimation techniques or very few statistical models can be solved by simply taking the data and applying algebra to get the estimates. Instead, we find the estimates iteratively with a computer by trying different values for the parameters, calculating a likelihood, and then finding a set of parameter values that makes the likelihood as large as possible. So that's the basic idea of numerical estimation or numerical optimization. Try different values for the parameter estimates and calculate the maximum, then find a set of parameter estimates that maximizes the likelihood by trying different values. The second question is why should an applied researcher care? Because this is something that the computer does for you, so you don't have to do this manually. The, the problem is that sometimes the task that you give to the computer is too challenging for the computer to solve. For example, you can have a model that is not identified or you can have a model that is empirically under identified or sometimes the computational algorithm for calculating the estimates simply fail. So what do you, what do, you do in that situation? For example, if you're a Stata user and your screen fills up with this kind of stuff. So you have here uh, the iterative estimation. So you have iterations and uh, Stata will just print the same likelihood over and over and over and tells you that something is not concave. What exactly is not concave and what does not concave even mean? Of course, you can just do trial and error. For example, simplify your model, change the um, options for the estimation or the optimization algorithm and so on and hope that that solves the problem. Another approach is to understand uh, what the non-concave means, why something is non-concave and what you can do about it when you understand the problem. Or you can have this kind of uh, estimation that terminates with error and uh, you have a, an error message about numerical derivatives. What are derivatives? If you have done calculus in high school, you know what the derivative of function is. But we are looking, uh, we want to have estimates. We are not interested in, in any derivatives. So, so why should we care about any derivatives? If you understand what the computer tries to do, then uh, you should understand why derivatives are important in optimization and why the fact that we can calculate derivatives is a problem and what we can do about that problem as well. Or you may get this kind of error message that tells you that the Hessian is not negative semi-definite. What, what is a Hessian? Uh, what does it mean that it's not se negative semi-definite? I have another video where I go into that in more detail, but uh, this video just gives an overview of what these concepts are and how they relate to numerical optimization. In another video, I, I go through uh, in more detail how we interpret the Hessian to uh, help us to find what exactly the problem is, why the model does not converge and what we can do about it. So the first problem that you can encounter is that your statistical software does not give you estimates. It can either go on forever, in, like in the first example, it just prints those iterations until it reaches the maximum limit, which in Stata is 16,000 or it prints, uh, goes on a little while and then prints out an error message for you. But all the same, you don't have any, any estimates to interpret. So that's the first problematic case. Second problematic case is that it's possible that you get these, these messages about not something being not concave, messages about Hessian, you get messages about um, derivatives, but you get estimates. So uh, can we trust these estimates? So we have these something is not concave, uh, something is backed up, we get estimates. So should we, we get estimates, is everything fine? Or should we care about this stuff and then understand what this stuff means before we go on and interpret these estimates? In this particular case, the model is not identified, which means that the estimates cannot be meaningfully interpreted. And or at least some of the estimates cannot be meaningfully interpreted. But Stata doesn't give us any indication in the actual output. If you look at the estimation history, the not concave 
gives us a signal that the model is not identified, but that's the only signal that we get in this particular case. This case, on the other hand, we get all kinds of, of error messages or notifications. Uh, we have these optimizations which into BFGS, optimizations which into BHHH, and uh, Hessen has contracted uh, that kind of things. But actually, in this case, the estimates are trustworthy. So when do these errors uh, or notifications here matter and when can they be safely ignored? This is something that we'll talk about in this video and in another video where I talk about the technicalities of the numerical optimization in more detail. What does numerical optimization do and what is actually being maximized? Let's take a look at the likelihood function that I've used in another video. And our task is to estimate population mean. We assume that the population standard deviation or population variance is one and our sample consists of three observations two, three and four and our task is to find the population that has the maximum probability or maximum likelihood of, of producing these observations here. This is the likelihood function so it gives us the, the likelihood. So what is the likelihood of, of getting these three observations when the population mean is for example at one? What is the likelihood at, at two and what is the likelihood when the population mean is at three? So the three here is the, the maximum is at three so the three is our maximum likelihood estimate. In practice for computational reasons we don't optimize the, the likelihood function directly. Instead we maximize the log likelihood. So the log likelihood is simply the logarithm of the likelihood function. And there are a couple of advantages to using the logarithms. One is that this log likelihood is quite commonly a concave function. So a concave function means that when we start from here then uh, we always turn right or we always curve down. So the idea is that uh, from every point of this curve we can we can see every other point. So it always goes to the, the same direction. It curves right and it never curves left. The raw likelihood instead it first if we start from here it curves up and then it curves down and then it curves up again. So we first curve left then we curve right and then we curve left again. So that is not concave. This is a concave function. Concave functions are easier for numerical optimization than non-concave functions. So that's one of the reasons why you get the, the not concave warning. It just tells you that computer is having some difficulties at some point of the likelihood function. How exactly do we find the maximum likelihood here? So it's pretty easy to see here that the maximum of likelihood is 3 because we have calculated the likelihood at every pixel from minus 2 to 6. This is like a, a, a couple of hundred different likelihoods at different values. We just choose the largest one. So that, that's one possibility. Calculate the likelihood at every possible value and pick the largest one. In practice that is not doable because if the, uh, the mean could be from minus infinity to plus infinity and if we are estimating more than one parameter if we estimate the mean and standard deviation for example then we have, uh, have to consider all possible combination of the parameters. And that's just way way too slow and sometimes not even possible to calculate with the computers that you have now. So in numerical optimization what we do is that um, we, we apply some math and uh, instead of trying to find the maximum we are actually trying to find the place where the derivative of this likelihood log likelihood function is zero. So if you remember the high school uh, calculus class the derivative gives us the direction to which the curve is going at the particular point. So the derivative here is, is positive because the curve goes up. The derivative here is negative because the curve goes down. So the derivative gives the slope of the tangent. So tangent is a line that we draw that touches the, uh, the curve at one particular point and shows the direction to which the line is going. The green line here is the derivative. So these are the derivatives. The derivative first is positive on the left side of 3 and then it's negative on the right side of 3. So it means that when we try different values of, of mean here, 
the likelihood will always increase when we go from left side of 3 towards 3 and when we cross 3 then the likelihood starts to decrease because they are derivative is negative. Then we have also second derivative which is the derivative of the derivative and uh, it's the purple line here shows us that uh, the, the slope of this first derivative is always negative. And when the second derivative is always negative then the function is concave. If the second derivative becomes positive then it's not concave. If it's always pos positive then we say that the, the uh, function is convex. But typically when we maximize something we want our functions to be concave instead of not concave or even convex. Some computers will actually do this slightly differently. So some computer implementations may not actually uh, maximize the likelihood but instead they minimize the negative of the likelihood in which case uh, you will see things like, like convex function and that kind of things. But in state which I use that as an example here we always maximize the, the log likelihood instead of minimizing the minus log likelihood. <laughs> so how do we find the maximum? There are different computational techniques for doing so and I'll, I'll explain first an easy technique. So let's assume that we uh, just want to calculate this uh, first derivative we find, try to find the, uh, where it's me, uh, zero, and we want to calculate the first derivative as few times as possible. So let's say that we calculate the first derivative at, at zero first and uh, we see that the derivative is positive. So let's go and then calculate the first derivative at another point. Let's say we use the point five, we see that they are, the derivative here is negative. The first derivative in, in many problems we know that it's a continuous function. So if it's the, uh, positive in one point and negative in another point then it must be zero in at least one point between those two points. So we can try another value and uh, we know that the, the zero point is between zero and five. So one one logical thing is to calculate it at 2.5 and we can see that okay the, the zero point is now it's between 2.5 and 5 because 2.5 uh, the derivative of 2.5 is positive at 5 the derivative is negative. So we can try something between 2.5 let's take from the middle and we get 3.75 then we know that okay that's negative the deriv derivative there so the uh, derivative must be zero somewhere between 2.5 and 3.75. So we can we can narrow down where the zero is and we split it again we get 3.12 the derivative is negative uh, so we know that the zero is between 2.5 and 3.12 we take something between we get 2.85 and now we know that okay that's a negative value for the derivative so the, uh, the zero must be between 2.85 and 3.12 so we get closer and closer to the actual value of three where it's zero and next we get 2.97 and that's close enough to zero the derivative that we conclude that that's our, our convergence point. So we found the, the zero of the derivative or the maximum of the likelihood at approximately 2.97. <laughs> this is called the bisection method and it's a simple method to understand. But uh, this is not commonly used because it's rather slow. So we can see here that this is 2.97 is correct only. Uh, it's correct only to the, uh, the second decimal. So the third decimal is, is incorrect already. If we uh, round it to, to one decimal, it's round to three, so it's correct to one decimal on two, two digit precision, it's incorrect because three is the correct value here. <laughs> so this bisection is, is slow, we don't use it. In practice, we quite often use something called the Newton's method or newton raphson method. And uh, this is used for example by Stata, this is used by, by M plus for certain problems. It u is used by some R packages for certain estimation problems. And uh, it's also one of the early algorithms and it's easy to understand. The idea of a Newton's method is that we start from an initial guess. 
So let's say that we guess from here we want to find the zero of this function x squared minus 4 and uh, we start from an initial guess called starting value. And our starting value now is 10 and we calculate the value of this function x squared minus 4 at 10 we get about somewhere about 100 and we calculate or we draw the tangent line. We calculate the derivative and then we draw the tangent line here. The tangent line tells us what is the direction of the, the curve at this particular point here. Then we uh, move along the tangent line until we hit zero. And that's our new estimate. So our new estimate is about five point something and we calculate the value of the function at five point something and uh, we calculate the derivative, we go along the tangent to zero and our new estimate is about three. That's our new estimate where the zero is. We calculate the function value at zero, we go along tangent, we are now very close to zero. We can see that um, the, the current estimate is 2.16 2.16 and uh, the, the correct value if we apply algebra here is, is 2. We apply another round of iteration and now we are correct on uh, three digits precision. If we apply again we get even more precision but at this point we can con declare that the function has converged. So the idea is that we uh, we calculate the function value, we calculate the derivative at the particular point of this curve and then we uh, go along the tangent until uh, we hit zero and this is mathematically how, how we proceed. So x is our initial guess x zero and then we uh, calculate the function value at x zero, we calculate the derivative at x zero and then we uh, divide the function value with the derivative and we subtract that from that starting value that gives us the value at first iteration. Then we proceed until uh, the, uh, the, the x changes by so little that we declare that it's, it's, the change is no more meaningful and we declare convergence. So this will get indefinitely precise. It will be uh, 2 at arbitrary degree of precision. Typically if we say that if we have like six or eight digits or 16 digits that's gonna be enough. So it just we just decided this is this is close enough so it's not it doesn't matter that it's not we don't get the exact value. So we never get an exact maximum but we get something that is very close to the maximum using these numerical techniques. <laughs> okay so this is how we find a zero. So we calculate the function value, we calculate the derivative of the function and then uh, that gives us the direction and how far we go. When we maximize something we are not seeking the zero of the function fx. Instead we are looking to maximize, looking for a zero for of the derivative. So when we maximize we replace the function value with the first derivative and when we maximize we replace the derivative of derivative of the, of the function with the derivative of the first derivative which is the second derivative. And this is the simple uh, if we have a one parameter problem. If we have two parameters that we estimate, let's say that we have a normal distribution, we estimate the mean and the standard deviation from the same data set using uh, one run of numerical optimization, then we have more than one derivative because there's one derivative for each parameter and we have also more than one second derivative. So with multiple parameters this first derivative becomes the gradient vector and these second derivatives go into the uh, what we call the Hessian matrix. So gradient vector includes derivatives of all parameters so it tells us how much the likelihood is going to change if we change every parameter by very small amount. And then the Hessian matrix tells us how much the gradient is going to change if we go to uh, some direction. Let's take a look at how this, uh, this works. But before that we need to understand that this Newton's technique is not a solution. It's not a general solution so it can fail. 
So the Newton te Newton's technique is works well when uh, all the derivatives exist and uh, in this particular case the second derivative at that point doesn't exist. So uh, Newton's technique fails. We go from, uh, from the initial guess of about 2, we go up along tangent, we go to minus 1.69, we go down, then we go along tangent, we get 2.32, we go up, then we go along tangent and we get further and further from the minimum or, or the zero which is here at, at zero. So there are scenarios that the Newton's method works well for some, for some functions but it doesn't work well for all functions. And uh, we can just let it go forever and ever and ever and it'll just end up further and further from, from the zero oscillating with the positive and negative values. So it's possible to find this zero point here. For example, if we uh, use the bisection method, we can just look for calculate at random points until we find at least one negative and one positive value and then start using the bisection method. We'll find that there are zero point is here, but Newton's method does not find it. It's therefore it's possible that these optimization techniques fail and in that case the solution to the problem if it's purely a failure of the optimization technique then uh, the solution to convergence problem is to switch to a different optimizer and for example Stata provides half a dozen different optimization techniques for some estimators for, for others there are less options but you can, you can switch to a different technique and see if that solves the problem. This is some of the things that I recommend as a first step for non-convergence problems because changing to a new optimizer is something that is quick to do and if it solves the problem then uh, that's problem solved and you can go on and, and address other problems. But there are also reasons why optimization fails that are not related to the actual optimization algorithm. Before I go into those problems, let's take a look at how optimization works in two parameter case. So this example that we had was estimating the mean, assuming that the variance is one and the sample is three observations, two, three and four. What if we estimate both mean and standard deviation? So we want to estimate two parameters. Now our likelihood function is a function of both the mean and the standard deviation. So it's no longer just uh, a function of the mean but it's, uh, it's uh, a function that takes two parameters the mean and the standard deviation here. So this is the shows the function values at um, using a contour plot. We can see that the function gets very 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 small when the standard deviation goes to minus one and the maximum of the likelihood is here at mean equals zero and uh, standard deviation of about 0.8 something. How does computer find the estimate? The computer finds the estimate by uh, for example using the Newton's method. So we have the initial guess. Let's say that we guess that uh, the mean is at 2, standard deviation is 1, then computer goes way up here first and then it comes back down and after 136 iterations of Newton's algorithm it finds a solution. So this is uh, less than a second perhaps on, on a modern computer. Of course if we try this was a difficult problem for Newton's method because um, the gradient here is very steep and uh, we can try different alg estimation algorithms or optimization algorithms for example, one that I like to use when the default, which is of the Newton, doesn't work, is BFGS, and it gets us to the solution using 11 iterations. So the idea is that we first calculate the likelihood of this combination, then that combination, then this combination, that combination, then we get closer and closer to the, uh, the, the true value. <laughs> or we can see that if we start from a different point, then the path is going to be different. If we start from, from here further, so our, our starting value for the mean is zero instead of two, zero is a lot further from three than two, then BFGS also takes 
138 iterations to go get to the starting point. So if the algorithm converges, then the speed of convergence depends mainly on, on two things. What is the algorithm and if it's well suited to that problem, but it depends more critically on the starting value. So Newton's method works well when the function has uh, continuous second derivatives, it's a smooth function, and uh, then the starting value is close to the actual value. So if we use Newton's method, we start from here, then we get even more iterations. How do gradient and Hessen then play in this picture? Let's take a look at what the computer is actually doing. So remember that in Newton's method, we take the, the starting value, we calculate the derivative at the starting value, we divide that derivative with the second derivative. So in, in multiple parameter optimization, we, de uh, we divide the, uh, the gradient with the Hessen matrix because we can divide with matrices. We uh, multiply gradient with the inverse of Hessen and that gives us the, the next point to try. So uh, let's take a look at these, what these numbers actually, how it, how it works. So this is the same problem and we are using Newton's method. We're starting from point where uh, mean is zero, standard deviation is one and log likelihood is minus 17. And uh, this shows this small red dot here shows that that's our position and these dashed lines just indicate where the positions are. And uh, this is the, uh, the likelihood function for the standard deviation calculated at mean fixed at zero. So if we fix the mean at zero, then estimating the standard deviation is simply finding a maximum of, of this function here. This is the, uh, the, the likelihood function where the standard deviation is fixed at one and we want to maximize, find the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean. So this is equivalent to the one parameter estimation problem that I showed before. And uh, this is the actual normal distribution that we draw for the data. We can see quite clearly that the, the normal distribution is off. So all these observations are the right hand side of the mean which is zero. So perhaps we should move this normal distribution to the right to make the maximum larger as, po as large as possible. Then we have the, the, uh, the first derivatives, the gradient vector. So that's the derivative with respect to m and that's the derivative with respect to, to, uh, to mean and standard deviation. The derivative with respect to standard deviation it lots, is a lot larger. So we can see that the derivative is larger means that the curve here, the likelihood curve is a lot steeper here. And when we when change s, then the likelihood is going to um, increase a lot more than if we change the mean the same amount. And uh, that tells us that or tells the optimization algorithm that it should actually start optimizing the standard deviation more than the mean. So the standard deviation needs to go up because the likelihood will increase if we go it up. The mean needs to go right that will make the like likelihood larger and then the computer will increase the mean a little, increase the standard deviation a lot because the likelihood is uh, the, the, the derivative is steeper and it ends up here. So we get to here and at that point when uh, the standard deviation is at 27 then uh, the likelihood does not really depend on the mean anymore because this is so wide that if we just switch uh, it sideways a little bit it doesn't really make a difference. So uh, the computer then starts to uh, find the uh, decrease the standard deviation because that's you can see here this point goes up so every time we increase standard deviation a little it goes up and up and up and this normal density that we fit to the data becomes more narrow and then we can see that the mean actually starts to matter. So this starts to uh, form a small peak and then the computer will find that there's actually a maximum in that relatively flat looking area as well. And then it'll hit following the, uh, the, the, the tangent it'll, or, or tangent which the gradient vector gives it will hit the minimum or the maximum likelihood in this case. So it found the maximum and we know that this is maximum likelihood for, for two reasons. First of all, 
the derivatives, the gradient, these are our zeros both. So if we just look at the um, likelihood of, the, of for this particular mean value, it's, it's flat here. So we are on the top. So if we go left or right, the, the value will, will decrease. And the standard deviation here, the gradient is, is flat. If we go left or right, the value will decrease. How do we know that it's a, it's, it's a peak instead of being like a bottom or being like an S-curve? We know it because these second derivatives, they are the diagonal elements of the Hessian matrix, I'll talk more, more, more about Hessian in another video, are negative. So when the second derivative is negative, we know that the curve, it, it curves down like that. And then the maximum is at when the mean is, uh, the, when the derivative is, is at zero. Also, the um, second derivative with respect to both standard deviation and mean, or the, the partial derivative rather, is close to zero. And that means that this is a, a nicely behaving optimization problem because the derivative of the mean does not depend strongly on the, on, on the value of the standard deviation. If we increase the, the standard deviation by a little or decrease by a little, then the derivative of the mean will stay about the same. And also if we increase the mean or decrease it by a little, then the derivative of the standard deviation stays about the same. So this, uh, in an ideal case, these diagonal or elements of Hessian matrix so the second partial derivatives, they should be all negative and uh, the off diagonal elements should be close to zero. And that's an easy problem then for the computer to solve. So that's, that's basically um, what you have in numerical optimization. You have the gradients. When you have found the maximum, the gradient vector is all zeros. All derivatives are zeros. All second order partial derivatives, the diagonal of the Hessian matrix are negative and the off diagonal elements are zero or at least not very large. And then you know that the model has converged well. How do, and, and computers give you different tests so you don't generally have to inspect these matrices yourself. When the computer declares convergence and there are no error messages, typically it means that these conditions hold. So how does this thing fail? Are there, or why, why does this thing fail? There are different reasons why the, the algorithm can possibly be non-convergent or produce you uh, a convergent solution that you shouldn't trust because there are some error messages. First of all, it's possible that the algorithm fails. So Newton's technique, which is often the default, assumes that the starting value is reasonably close to the actual maximum likelihood. And uh, also it assumes that the function is smooth. If your algorithm fails, there are two, two solutions to this problem. One is better starting values or try different algorithm. Typically trying a different algorithm is a lot quicker than, than thinking about the starting values. So personally, if the uh, normal technique fails, I go with BFGS. If it doesn't give me any estimates, then I, I'll start doing other diagnostics. Then it's possible that the likelihood or the derivatives cannot be calculated. And, uh, this can be for a couple of reasons. It can be a lack of identification of the model. It can be uh, that our algorithm cannot be applied to a particular scenario. So it's possible that we can still find a minimum or, or maximum of the likelihood by using a different optimization technique that does not use, for example, the Hessian matrix or the second derivatives. Or we can try better starting values because this problem can be a specific to a certain set of parameter values. Then it's possible that the computer implementation fails and this is different from the algorithmic failure. And the computer implementation failure basically uh, relates to purely computational problems. So it can be that your, your likelihood or the derivatives are at some point they are so close to zero that the computer rounds them to be exactly zero because computers have finite precision. And uh, things can go wrong when you are uh, because of this rounding to zero. So if you have a derivative that is uh, rounds to zero, then you don't know whether you go left or right when you want to increase, maximize the likelihood. Different algorithm, better starting values, or even different software implementation can help in this stage. 
So these computer implementation failures are something that uh, developers of statistical software actually, they, they tweak the algorithms to avoid these numerical problems. For example, sometimes you may multiply all the parameters by a constant or you might multiply the likelihood by a constant to uh, make sure it doesn't go to x to uh, round to zero. Then it's possible that uh, you reach the maximum number of iterations. So the, we, why we have maximum number of iterations is that sometimes the computer is simply unable to get uh, any maximum likelihood estimates for us. It can't find a maximum. So we tell the computer to, for example, try thousand different values. If it can't find any, then declare that the model is not convergent. The reason why there's a maximum number of iterations is that for some problems, the maximum likelihood does not exist or it's not unique, in which case, uh, if we don't limit the number of iterations, the computer would just run forever and forever and forever and never stop running. And we don't want to have that, so we limit the iterations. You can also increase the limit yourself. So what you can do is uh, use a different algorithm, uh, better starting values or increase the iterations. Then it's possible that the maximum likelihood estimates do, do not exist. I have a video talking about this in the context of uh, logistic regression analysis. This can happen, for example, when some of the parameters converge toward positive or negative infinity. So a parameter can never reach infinity, but you can always make it slightly larger. And in that case, you can just modify the model or collect more data because those are the two remedies. It's possible that the model is not identified, which uh, means that there is no unique solution to the problem. And in that case, the only thing that you can do is to modify the model. Collecting more data does not help. So if you are collecting just one variable and you say that the mean of that variable is a function of two parameters a and b, you cannot solve or, or estimate a and b at the same time because you only have one mean and you cannot estimate two different quantities from one quantity. The final reason why the algorithm can fail is empirical under-identification. And this basically relates to a scenario where some of the, uh, the parameter values are so close to zero that the uh, model becomes, becomes basically unidentified. So it's as if a parameter wouldn't exist in the model. And uh, these all are something that you, you need lots of practice to be able to diagnose and you need to understand what the, uh, what the computer does when it tries to find the maximum because the only, only output that you get is the parameter values, the gradient and the Hessian. And by interpreting these different things, particularly interpreting the Hessian, which I talked about, which I discussed in another video, you can uh, make at least an informed guess on what the problem may be.